State Department of Education. Carolyn Thompson, State Department of Education. Shelly Ellis, State Department of Education. Jennifer Allen Barron, Oklahoma Arts Council. Elizabeth Russell, Fine Academy Command. Jay Lear, Rock Public Schools Alternative Programs. Brian Abernathy, Regional Food Bank. Jack Reed, Oklahoma City Public Schools. Garden Del Reno. Cindy Allen, Altus Public Schools. Cheryl Tatum, Insight School of Oklahoma. Missy Corn, State Department of Education. Hartley Harper, School of the South. Okay. And I know that Julia's on the phone um, from DHS. Is there anyone, I'm sorry, is there anyone else on the phone? Don Raleigh from Pryor. Okay. Anyone else? And Julia, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Just making sure you got connected. Okay. Um, really today, um, you'll see uh, the agenda. We're just kind of wrapping up what we've accomplished this school year, um, looking at those um, working group goals, um, as well as the overarching three goals, and kind of determining what we want next steps to be, what we want to expand upon, um, or, or kind of establish that game plan, I guess. Um, so let's just kind of start with the first working group, I guess. Which is data. The data is, um, last year we had quite a few meetings on data. Sorry, I need to pull out my notes so that I know where to. The first objective is to study current data trends in alternative ed, identify what student and program data should be collected, and analyze data for training programs and incentives to improve outcomes. This year, we added the reasoning data back in as to why they're entering into alt ed. Um, I know that made it go from like 40 some more questions to 60 some more questions, just in the way that it was set up. Um, that was really the only new data um, that was added. Are there any pieces of data you think need to be included that should not be included that we're asking? I know only 164 of you out of 317 programs have completed that data, so you might not even know what that is yet. So. Anybody, we're okay with what it is right now. I know last year the group kind of came to consensus. You would like it in the system. I believe that's still the consensus of the group. Um, and then the other was it really depends on what the accountability working group kind of goes with. So is that still a good path? Do you feel those objectives need to change for any reason? Do, they, do we need to add? It doesn't show the improvement. If you're looking for the improvement, the questions used to say, how many absences did they have in the semester prior to coming to alternative right. school? How many absences? Now it asks how many absences they've had in the last full semester at alternative school. Right. Well, I mean, at one one year, mine were over 800 absences prior to coming, and then once they came. Right. It went down. We no longer have that pre-post. Right, right. That individual student pre-post. And even, yeah, so that was kind of, and then to me, those questions, there's like four of them. Like how many credits do you, how many students had enough credits to be counted as a senior at the beginning of the year? And then it changes and says how many had enough to graduate as juniors, I mean, that's so convoluted, and I sent that out to my teachers, I probably, I got immediate calls, you know, what does this right. mean, what does this mean, I'm trying to explain, well, you have to include all of them in that second question, that first one is just the seniors, and it was just, right. I don't know, I know what you're looking for, if you could just point blank say, how many extra students did you graduate that graduated early, or something, besides the wording, you know, it's just, that's hard for me, the wording on some the of those questions on about the credits. Yes. Okay, so looking at that? Yeah, and just point blank say, 
how many 11th graders did you graduate that graduated a year early, you know, because that's, that's what you're asking. But the, the people reporting the data to me don't understand those questions at all. Okay. Have to reiterate. So look at, the, look at the verbiage. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what happens when the student is not in the classroom? Layman question coming from yes. an outside organization. Do we okay. ask any questions in this, in this data about uh, food security or about conditions in, uh, as far as uh, economic conditions inside of the home, couch surfing, anything like that? We do have some reasoning data. We don't ask food security questions, so that might be a good one. I do know that when we go out in our evaluation rubric, we do talk about food security and homelessness. Um, in the reasoning data, we do talk about the homelessness um, and the economically disadvantaged, all those kinds of reasoning questions. There's like 12 different ones and then another column. I think that might be good to look at. Any Jennifer? Yes. If we add questions or want to add other metrics to the uh, questionnaire, can that be sent to us earlier in the year so we know to start collecting the data? Like for, if I'm, if I'm going to start collecting data on how many of my students utilize the food pantry, for example, or do any of that, uh, that's easier to collect as it's going on rather than to try to recreate it at the end of the year when there's not very much uh, data collected on it. Right, yes, we can make sure that happens. I know we kind of pinpointed at the regional meeting where it was on the website, but um, I'm not really sure how long you can keep a Google document open. Add infinitum. We've got some that have been up for about four and a half, five years. Yeah, so, so we, could, we could absolutely look at that. Okay, any other questions on these? Do we think the overall, the, the three stated objectives need to stay for right now? Is custody status one of the questions? DHS, yes, and OJA are reasoning. Also good. Okay. Any other? I would. Yeah. Sorry, Jennifer. Yes. Um. I know that the if the custody status question is on there, that's great. But I still want to point out that the Department of Human Services sends names of everyone in custody to the Department of Ed. Okay. So, um, from a data standpoint, if there's any way. Um, we can get that information into the systems the schools are using. That's just one more really great way for them to identify them at risk. Okay. Youth. Okay. And we may need a change in our MOU, but or the information's out there in the cloud or whatever. Okay. Did you put that in the notes, Missy? Okay. That's an Eric question, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Any other good to go? Moving on. Okay. The next one is the evaluation um, working group. This one. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. Um, so every year when we do our funding ask for Alted, we always kind of struggle to tell the story of how Alted programs are doing because of the data collection. So I don't know what all you guys have, have changed with the data collection, but do you feel like we're overall in a better place to, because if we could tell the story, for example, of the absences that are reduced or um, you know how kids are thriving, but the data, at least that I'm aware of, the data that we have to show doesn't tell the story that we need it to tell. Even though the stories are there, the data doesn't, doesn't connect to that. So do you feel like we've made progress on that over the last year or in, are in a better place? I think we're in a better place. We're not in that individualized pre-post so we can see game. Um, that's a really big mm -hmm. database that they have to still hand input um, that we did, didn't really want to task um, them with, but we've always kind of kept on the back burner. Um, 
we did add the questions because it was difficult last year to get the, even the grad rate. So that's where we did ask those questions. You know, how many seniors and how many juniors? And then we asked the cohort, like, how many do you get on track to graduate in the four year, five year, six year? So we have that data now. And we do have the reasoning data now. So we can say this percentage of those kids is coming in because they're pregnant parenting this many or so they can kind of grasp what those numbers look like. Those are some of the pieces that we've added in this year okay. that I hope will better diversify than just this, we serve 15,000 kids. Okay. And yeah. this year going into next year or this year the year that we just finished? This year we think we just finished. Okay. That's what's coming in right now. Okay. I just want to make sure as we're moving into next year, we understand what we did add this year and yeah. think about what we need to add then right. for next year and if Working with Eric, since we have already kind of had those conversations, I would like that pre-post so we do see gain. Um, but it's just a matter of, I think, getting it in the system and how we could get it in the system. Okay. And he doesn't believe we could get it for this school year, but we could for the next. Okay. Any other questions? You know, I guess I do have a question, maybe on data collection. <laughs> And, and that is, and, and I don't know if you put this number in there somewhere or not, but because all said, you know, some people think that you get sent there. Right. The rumors out there. But, and maybe we need to know, but like, do you all get phone calls to like, hey, I want to get my kid in your program? Mm -hmm. oh, and, yeah. and so you have to go on Every another day. waiting list and you Every go, day. well, you do fit in this criteria. But I mean, that, that is a thing that I think that people are knowing locally about us is that we run off of a waiting list and it's not, it's a good waiting list. I mean, really, right. you know, I mean, I, especially junior and seniors, I, I get a lot of calls from parents and I go, you have to go back to the high school because they, they manage the list, you know. Right. And so that just may be something down the road to look at that, you know, we, we're getting some upper level kids that struggle in some areas, but parents just want them in our program because everybody in this room is good at what you do. Mm -hmm. And so. Right. It's become a huge issue huge in my district because um, they just want their kids. The high school is big. UConn has grown. It's crazy. Yeah. They move in from a small town or they have a kid that's acting up and getting in trouble and getting in trouble and they're like, I want them and all. I'm like, you're not appropriate for all. You know, first off, you have to be in good standing with the high school. I don't take kids that are suspended. I send them to CCEC or the MOVE program, you know, that immediately makes them mad, you know, especially if they're having discipline issues and mad at a teacher or mad at a coach or mad at a counselor or principal. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I mean, I even had someone call her and complain that we were blocking their kids, you know. Um, it's, <laughs> right. and they, it, it is, it's hard to vet what's, who's appropriate and those wait lists, you know. Right. It is. From my perspective, when I get those parent phone calls or even those district phone calls, I talk about the fact that they do have to go back through either the principal or the counselor, whoever that traditional is, to work through that system. Um, and then even last week working with Tulsa on that at-risk criteria indicator survey and the fact that it's, I ne I've never thought of it as first come, first serve. I've always thought of it as most at risk. And so being able to have that, that numerical score kind of on that um, and that's kind of where Missy and I have talked and even as some of you guys and I have spoken about the evaluation rubric um, as part of the evaluation even kind of formalizing and writing what your definition of an alt-ed kid is so that when we come out you kind of already have that that written down um, um, as part of your documentation or your evidence when you're working through the evaluation rubric and that might kind of even help you then deal with some of those does Other anybody scenarios. have one? Because we were going to put one together this summer, a rubric and like what the pathways are for each at-risk kid. Does anybody already have a rubric that's like, that says the, these are the criteria and these, uh, uh, like a There's point rubric? That there is well, a point rubric. If you're homeless, this gets website. you jumped up. Is there? Mm -hmm. Okay. I probably, probably just have And I will tell you something that I, I really like in a lot of um, programs is 
in their student contract, they write the 17 criteria in there. So everybody knows that your child's going to get individual or group counseling. Yeah. It's written into law. Yeah. You're going to be doing some service learning projects. This is what it looks like. You're going to be doing art therapy. So the parents don't get, well, why is my kid in therapy? <laughs> well, <laughs> you sign that form, you know. So if you can actually be up front with all that stuff, mm -hmm. it's fabulous. It makes okay. it so much easier for everything you do. Okay. So um, on that resources and form tab, um, up here at the top under intake and screening, you have an elementary at-risk identification criteria, a middle school and a high school. And it just kind of says, are you low socioeconomic or minority status? You get one point. And it just kind of goes through how credit deficient are you and gives different rankings and, and points. And transient, OJA, DHS, are you just in the legal system? Have you previously been in all dead? What about behavior? Kind of looking at suspensions. But again, it's just a piece of the puzzle, not the whole puzzle. Um, and attendance. And if we need to add something to this, then we absolutely can. But then at least you know you've got the three different levels. I was going to say, I'm putting this on my referral form, but I'm taking the scores off so that when it's coming from the counselors at the traditional high school, they don't have the student they really want to get rid of and start marking <laughs> the high point. <laughs> they just won't know the scoring. And then when we go through and, um, and uh, discuss the the uh, criteria we would already have this form scored right. for each student but the one of my social workers brought up that she didn't think that the um, low socioeconomic or minority status uh, belonged on there and I tried to explain it to her but but um, she thinks it marks our minority students um, uh, out in front. And I told her I said well even if I took it off it wouldn't affect, you know, I just take it off for everybody, then nobody marks it. The rest of the criteria on there are good indicators and gives us a better picture than just a name on a piece of paper. So that's how that's how we'll be using it next year. I'm going to just implement this so that the schools transfer, recommending the student go through and mark all this and, and give me a better picture of the students we're getting in. Right. And it would be interesting to see what the S SATs knew university score what they kind of plug in there might be I don't know how do you guys know how they've kind of tallied that no okay have you guys heard of that everybody that they're going to give an adversity I guess because of the whole college admission now yeah. you're if you're you're going to get this extra special score because you fit in these categories so it'd be interesting to see what they they, they put in those categories I think I think we're the rubric what the rubric does too is it holds some sort of rubric holds us accountable to really pause and look through all aspects of a student's application. So many times when you're busy and you're flipping through, you can get you can you don't stop and maybe check some of these areas. I do think you have to be careful that you don't overlook at scores. Sometimes I think there could be one category on there that trumps everything, and you right. need to bring them in. But um, yeah, I just. Uh, that's what for me is it's I feel like if I'm using it like I'm kind of like I've got a rubric but I have not been consistent okay. any other okay so several things now that we're one year in we've used it for one the two evaluation rubrics um, we did meet lots of you gave feedback on that um, so something we're going to be looking at is underneath the um, each of the 17 sections, we're going to add an evidence and documentation. So what are the kinds of things you need to kind of have already prepared when we come to visit? So like faculty selection, obviously it would be that teaching out of certification form. Um, under counseling, it might be counseling logs, how many times topics that they said um, that they discussed. Uh, who those, if you're bringing in outside people, who those people are, what's what's that credentialing um, kind of, so that you're kind of already collecting before we get there. Um, so we'll have some of those kind of on that same page. Um, 
can I add something to that? The last um, probably two or three months that as I've gone out to um, visit, I've actually asked schools to come up with like a three ring binder. And so in every area have evidence that I, we can go through quickly just like she said. Just like have some hard evidence. I know you have a lot of verbal but it's real easy to flip through a three ring binder as we sit there because there's just not enough time. If your um, meeting usually takes, you know, two, three, four hours, if you're a full day program, sometimes longer. So that really makes it easier for us. And then you're not looking for it. So if we ask for those things, you're not digging through your computer or through your file cabinet. You know, when we're asking about um, where your formal career and behavior goals for each of your kiddos, because we do know they're coming in because of attendance. So where is that goal you've set with them? And you're like, well, it's more just a conversation. They're kiddos, right? They're, they don't remember what you talked about last week. And they just kind of see it as nagging if you're having that conversation daily. So let's, what's that kind of that SMART goal? Where is that established? Um, and that kind of goes along then with ICAP. That was the other thing. Um, you guys said you wanted to change the individual graduation plan and go ahead and call it ICAP. I know that when I've been out, I've gone ahead and said, whatever you're doing with freshmen, make sure your all deads are included in those. You were already supposed to be doing those things, so just go ahead and, and get them. And again, it in integrates them back into the traditional setting to kind of give them some of those, those social, emotional kind of interactions as well, not so isolated. I do know that um, they really like the middle school rubric. Um, is, was there any input for anybody that did get a middle school rubric this year? Anything stand out? Anything you guys see that needs to be added to the high school rubric? The other was more examples. They liked more examples. And I think it, that will help with the documentation and the, the evidence component too. So you're just going to send us a list or just add it on to? I'm hoping that I can up. just add it to the rubric so that when you're sitting yeah. down yourself before the visit and thinking this is where I think I'm at, you're going ahead and seeing, well, those are the kinds of things. So I definitely, especially when we have the personal face-to-face -face battle on are you effective or highly effective, well, it's really going to depend on how much you can prove it, right? So that will be just like your accreditation. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of it is verbal. Like and when I ask you guys, you know, sometimes to pull it out, mm -hmm. there's just some people that just go, oh, it's over there. Oh, it's in my counselor's office. Let me go. So it's just too hard. And I don't want them to be running all over the building when I have allowed three hours for them. Right. So I think it would. And maybe we should come up with some forms. Maybe what are you doing for life skills? Here's the forms. This is what we're doing weekly or counseling or, I, I mean, I don't know something that we might. Well, the RIO just sends off that checklist for all that. You just got to go, and if they want something on there, they put, you know, like the teacher contracts. That's right. 5%. Mm -hmm. So do you want us to come up with a, a checklist? Great. That'd be great. Okay. Perfect. That just would get be a, a good tools, idea. We'll stick it on the, as a table of contacts and mm -hmm. tab it up and hand you a binder when you walk in, like okay. the RIO gets. Okay. All right. Other comments on evaluation? So since we've kind of met these, I know we'll always come back to them as we're adapting and growing um, and changing those point systems, um, just like in the past. Um, do we need to be working on anything evaluation since we've kind of checked these two off? Do we still need this working group? Very chatty, it's already summer. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't need it to meet on a regular basis, but maybe towards the end of next year to see how the documentation evidence has, has worked out and having a second full year of the implementation, maybe review it to see if it's still effective or if it's meeting the goal of the program. Okay, because right now we've only done the odd regions and new program, new director, and struggling program, so at least that will give us 100% of the state and two years for those struggling programs. Okay? This one is the funding working group. Um, so it was to create a proposal to update the Alt Ed um, funding formula, and we just kind of wrapped the whole bill up into this. 
Um, House Bill 2520 has passed. You do have a copy of that in your folder. We did in December um, the state board passed rules. I'm not quite sure where those rules has everything been signed. They're approved. They're approved, so the rules are in there as well. I believe we'll have to update the rules again with the new bill, but at least we'll know going into this next school year. The bill goes into effect not this school year, but the next school year. Well, the whole bill is in effect this school year. The funding change is not to effect until next school year. Okay. So funding two years, everything else next year. Rules next year. So we'll update the rubrics then based on those things because one of the changes is that you have to have fans on art. You will no longer show me music appreciation on Odyssey Wear um, as your art component. Um, so that will be something we'll have to um, work in with that. Um, trying to think of some other updates, but I'm sure there will be updates. I'll just need to go through it. So maybe meeting the evaluation work, working group meeting and end of July, August-ish to get feedback on whatever changes Missy and I make over the summer and then again at the end of the year. Okay? And then today we'll also discuss a virtual, an, um, an alt-ed virtual student definition. We have already kind of established a credit recovery definition and updated the alt-ed definition. So um, we'll kind of discuss that here in a minute. But that was under the broad, broaden the options and the definitions. Any questions there? Any additions, changes? Okay. Can I ask just a really ignorant question? Yes. For most all and programs, is there, what does art education look like? I mean, I'm assuming there's probably not funding for like a full time. Where does that come from? <laughs> so, Jennifer Allen Barron, we do have alt ed money set aside with the Arts Council, so some do okay. grants through them. Some will send into their art teacher. Um, some will co teach with that art teacher and they'll just do some things. Uh, have other programs that, um, like Warner Public School, she couldn't be here today, but um, she has like a Pinterest corner and other programs where they've kind of tied it to their um, service learning. So they'll make like wreaths or art projects or Christmas cards and do stuff with the, like the, the retirement center in the home. So it's just kind of very different across the state. It's still in that therapeutic. Some have puzzles and those coloring books out, those kinds of things. Okay. I'm just curious, I, I think we mentioned uh, a Department of Mental Health and part of like the research that I'm particularly interested in is art as a practice for wellness, for prevention wellness. So that's kind of why I was just curious. And mm -hmm. I don't know if resources would ever be needed if I come across things like if Absolutely. I did send them along as using Absolutely. art as a means of wellness. So yeah, that is, we, we typically have a few areas for our struggling districts that are pretty consistent and art is one of those because mm -hmm. art's been cut for everybody. Right. So I went in and he was like, I don't have art for anybody. I don't have band, I don't have anything for anybody. So you're asking me what I do for my old dead kids, and it's the same as I do for all my kids, <laughs> which is unfortunately nothing at this point. So, so what do you do about that? It's like, okay, just working you down, move on. We give them examples yeah. of ways that you can do it. Again, you know, you, you've got that teaching out of certification form, so you don't have to be a certified art teacher, but that doesn't mean you can't do something, do something you know, so. I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of information, just a brief. Um, so our agency, the Oklahoma Arts Council, has some money set aside that schools can apply for grants specifically to bring in artists and residents. And those can come from the approved artists on our roster or other artists who are you know, in that community to lead hands-on instruction. And in any discipline, it could be visual arts, performing. Um, so uh, I definitely would love to give any school more information about those but I just wanted to give you a, just a little brief description of, so, so we do have that. Any um, alt ed school can apply for um, those funds. I think my daughter's school actually takes advantage of that, and it's really wonderful. They have an artist that comes in. And well, Jody, who's sitting next to you, I know she, and at UConn takes advantage, and Elizabeth and Comanche also um, apply for those, those grants every year, so um, I'd love to talk to you more about it. I mean, I don't want to, but I just wanted to, Looks like there's we're on the subject. 
But it could even be um, some go come into the arts festival um, and they kind of have set up there and lots of visits to different museums. Even she, you know, her kiddos through that, they do a, do you still display, do an art show at the... We go to the Chisholm Trail at Heritage Center take where kids art for a month and then we can go see it at the museum and then we have a big art show so there's lots of different ways that they're just yeah. yep that's why we're here um okay and so then this last one is accountability this was the other area that um we did have um an all dead day at the capitol so that really established um that goal number one again trying to fully um inform the purpose of behind all dead to all those different parties out there um I have heard over the spring that they want to do that again. Sometimes um, this time it was a really quick turnaround, so they would like a date sooner, but definitely there's interest. Um, the last one is to create a proposal to the A through F report card. I know that with rolling out the report card for the whole state and all of those different kinds of things and components that go into it, um, we haven't made a lot of movement there. Um, have talked with Dr. Miller. Um, they the accountability office is still doing some research and um, so they want to have some of those we hope to bring you some of their ideas next school year because um, she said we're ready to internally kind of have that conversation from what I've heard so um, but Michael Tambor Borsky is working on that that for us so that's kind of where we're at for goal number two any other goals changes to goals so I do wonder oh, one, two, both schools. I wonder with uh, if there are other likely art districts who are uh, beneficiaries of the CSI grant and all the dictates and expectations that come with that. Um, and wondering where there's overlap or support or even coordination with all in and that department around. You know, for us to go from being, and we're not, you know, we're not measured. Our true work is not measured in that report card. <coughs> But to be consistently in F school because of the high mobility and just the needs at the schools. Um, I do feel this pressure with CSI now to grow from an F to a D to a C. I just feel that pressure. So I'm wondering what coordination looks like or support um, with our programs. Right. I know that when. Um I believe it was Monica that came to speak to us a couple of meetings ago. She got our input. We kind of gave her that we want that more growth mindset. We want that pre-post kind of in there, how that really works out um, and how we could really logistically do that within our system. I just know that those were the kinds of things where we, again, we could say, there are 800 absences and now I've gotten down to 100 absences. You know, those kinds of, I do know that those were the kinds of things we were wanting to show. Does that make sense? And yeah. then that kind of helps a little bit show our picture a little better. So I wonder if that's the, if the rubric is the measure that we spoke of prior. I'm wondering if that can take the place of additional measures that are, and this isn't, uh, this isn't me saying I want to opt out or escape from those expectations because they are really realistic expectations. But internally, we've crafted different expectations in this rubric. And I'm wondering if that rubric can, can be a part of that coordination of growth and effectiveness as opposed to some of these other, because we're talking at least nine indicators. Of, and they are realistic indicators, but I just want to make sure that and I think too with you know having rep representing the charters who are district as well, the charters have three layers of accountability who are alternative. Aid. So I'm wondering also like even with accreditation um, and evaluation through alternative education, I'm wondering how they can be one because there's so much dual reporting happening um, that it becomes it comes off very formalities as opposed to right. So right. those are my two questions. Okay. Right. So I know that there are six of you that do have a site code of your standalone, you get a report card, there are six of you. I know that all six of you kind of approach it very differently. 
Um, some of you do do the appeal. Um, some of you chose not to do the appeal. Um, from that aspect, I don't know why you guys made those determinations. Um, I know that that's an office with federal <coughs> guidelines, where ours are state guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so we have flexibility to create an, an alternate school report card for all the sites, so the six sites that get a report card, but it still has to meet federal law. So the question, to your point, is how to merge perhaps the, right, right. the evaluation rubric with what's federally required in the existing report card. And to be honest, back to the previous conversation, a lot of that relies on data. So do we have the data to feed into a report card to actually grade you? And would you want us to grade you on on data when it comes to some of the other things that you're doing? Well, would you want to have an indicator for that? You may not want to be graded on, on certain portions of that rubric, but they may not be a valid thing to incorporate. So I think that's the conversation that we have to have now that the first school report card is out um, and, and things are kind of coming more easily um, in that department, it's, it's now a good time to have that conversation about how if we want to approach that. And that's where we'll have to rely a lot on, on the recommendations of this group and, and have more, uh, obviously a lot more detail, intense conversations about what that, that would look like. Because I do know that about this time last year, the data working group made the recommendation to kind of keep that Google Doc because if I did build a, a data, student database that we sent out to you for the data with the pre and the post, that was really kind of frowned upon because of the amount of time it took to do that since it wasn't automatically part of the wave or you know, you're, you're taking information from the wave and putting it into a database, but right now that's the only way I could do it. So this group recommended at this time last year to hold off on that. That doesn't mean that the group now wants to make that recommendation. So if you guys want to recommend that over the summer I do put in a work order to, to build a database that I can email out to you, we could do that. I think maybe if we have the discussion first about like what data is needed, kind of curious, you know, what they were talking about as far as do we have the data to show, because I do think we have effective programs and I do think the data is there that shows that. Right. And so sometimes it's asking the right question. Right. And so I think that if we understand, like, okay, if, if we could have an ADEF report card that would more accurately reflect the work that's being done in schools, so they wouldn't necessarily just be an F because of, you know, the current, you know, formula, then what data is missing there that, that answers that question that then we would collect. Right. You know, so then that way we set it up in the right way in the first time, you know, the first time, because it will be extra work for everyone. And, right. and I think if it's getting us to where we need it to be as far as telling the story we need to tell, then... You know, I think that, I mean, at least for me, I'd be willing to do that work, but I want to make sure we, we are not just collecting to collect. Right. Well, I think, yeah, so let's take attendance. That should be on growth. That should not be on how many attend. If you know, it would be some bean counting, but if we need to do that, because the way is not going to be probably able to go in and pull the growth for Johnny, who was a dropout last year, but the year before, he did spend a semester at the other high school and was only there 25% of the time, but is now with me, and he's there 50% of the time. Right. Well, that's a 200% growth in attendance, but it would look awful. Or a one-time SAT where after everybody that had taken it, I think it ends up eight kids, of which one was able to get a proficient on the SAT, okay. you know, and again, that came in with so many gaps. If you're going to do the one shot, one stop SAT score, right. um, I mean, I don't know. It's a hard. I don't, I don't think there's an easy. I don't think there's an easy answer to this question. Right. Yeah. Rather than so. test scores, you're looking at pre and post GPAs. I mean, you're looking at pre and post attendance, like you said. And we used well, to give tape scores. I mean, we used to do star. We used to even have those. So here's what I would argue, if we're an effective, if we're an effective or highly effective program on the rubric, either one, then I would argue that the report card would come out of A, B, or C. And if you can't, Great. the way the report card's coming out is going to have to get a D or an F, but the rubric, and the, I love the rubric, I think, actually, I think the rubric model would be a better model for all public schools in Oklahoma. <laughs> if you could, what you two do could go into the regular sites. I, I Why couldn't know. the rubric be our report card? 
Well, there's, but she's there's federal it doesn't guidelines. Doesn't meet federal law. Yeah, it doesn't meet federal, doesn't meet federal law. law. Right. And right now, I mean, so we have to have an, an academic achievement score that right. has long-term goals, yeah. and we have to have um, it has to be based on statewide test scores. So the, the statewide test that we give. Um, that's federal. Yeah. And yeah. Hard, you can't, with high school, I suppose you can't. And graduation get, uh, rate, that's defined in federal law how we calculate graduation rate. Is the correct with academic, like SAT, there is no way to do like a growth model on that because the last test would have been eighth grade. Yeah, we keep, um, I mean, we're, we're thinking through a lot of potentials for that because that's clearly a piece that's missing for high school. Even for the regular schools, right? Growth. Oh, yeah. A yeah. one day yeah. test that a kid really doesn't even have to care about, but we're going to, is it 40% of the score comes off? 75? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember the but, but it's pretty big percentage for a group of high school mm -hmm. students, not even all tested, but I thought, man, they don't even have to care about it. And, yeah. And right now, even our disconnect with all 317 of you is we come out and we do the rubric sometime within the school year. You give me data at the end of the year, and I do go back and look at your data and kind of connect, but there isn't that automatic connection, connection and adjustment. Does that make sense? Like, you could have the components in place and score effective on the rubric, but then your data comes back and shows that you really weren't an effective program because you didn't have the successful student outcomes, but you have the teacher there or you have the program in place. It's just not, your kid isn't being successful. Does it? So we even have that breakdown right now. I'm just wondering if, if we couldn't just add to the current report card. So you have the current report card that takes care of the federal side and then an amendment to the... Uh, the current report card that that takes into account the rubric for the um, alternative ed and then gives an adjusted score based on that. Yeah, like you say, collect all or they said, but then the different formula they come up with the data F piece that really weighs in that rubric. I mean, one of the other problems is this: so all of the indicators have to be able to be disaggregated um, down to student subgroup. Yeah. So, like, I don't know that the rubric is something that it wouldn't be a data point that's able to be disaggregated. So it would have to be, because of the rubric space on the school, it's yeah. you're not a rubric giving a rubric to a student. And so, I mean, it's possible you can use data that the rubric collects if it's on an individual student basis. And we used to do that. So, it I mean, that's huge. one of the it other It was a huge mess. We, pr so we printed it out, more. taped it together, put it on the wall, <laughs> and everybody came and did their columns, and then the registrar, if you remember that, then put it all into the database, and then you had to email it back. It was a big to-do for 400 kids, <laughs> kids through a school that? year. It's a big to-do for 100. Yeah. So. Okay, so thinking of data and thinking of accountability going into next year, just so that I think we're all here really wanting to have those two conversations, connecting those two groups, um, bringing in Eric and bringing in the accountability office to kind of see where we want to go, but not making any decisions for next year. Is that what I'm hearing? I mean, I think it's just a presentation on what the capabilities are and what the requirements are to this group will then help you be able to think better about what could be possible. Okay. I mean, there are certain things that are going to have to stay, but for example, and I'm just throwing things out here, I mean, we could do something different with the chronic absenteeism indicator, you know, for example, or we could add another non-academic indicator, possibly, but again, it has to be on the student level, it has to be able to be disaggregated, and it has to be data that we have by a student. So, I mean, that really kind of constricts what you can do, but if we can think about maybe what data we want to collect, maybe at some point it can be a part of it, more of a long-term kind of plan to move that direction. Okay. But I think maybe if we have those presentations, then that will help the group get their, you know, get there and get them mm -hmm, okay. started thinking about what the possibilities could be. Okay. But we're still not state mandated to have our own report card, right? We're still under our home school. So now yeah, you're still my superintendent only said fight for that. No. Do not do not <laughs> let yourself get mandated out of that. No, you, yeah. We have these six okay. that have a report card. Three hundred and seventeen we have these six. Okay. Okay, so those are the four working groups.
We haven't heard add anything. We've heard just kind of tweak maybe once a year for evaluation, really focusing on data and evaluation. Was there anything that needed to be added as a, as a, as a working group? I know I kind of thought about the subgroups um, where we kind of, I know that sometimes coming into our office, districts and I and just law and DHS and OJA struggle with barriers for OJA and DHS kids. I did not know if that needed to be a working group. Sometimes that 19 to 21 group is very difficult for districts to kind of wrap their ha head around. But as we're looking at those subpopulations, do we need to kind of start providing guidance or I thought that might be a good working group. And if we're kind of talking about what those subpopulations have to be within a report card, that might even help us with accountability and data. But someone back here had hand up. Yes. I'd like to see added, and I don't know which working group this could go in or if this needs a new working group or we just do it with the uh, legislature. Um, but something in there that, that um, limits the ability of districts to um, place teachers who may not be appropriate for alternative ed into an alternative ed program. And I would even say, I'd go as far as saying that there are some restrictions in a union contract that, that um, don't fit into the alternative ed model. So if there could be a way to write into law uh, automatic waivers to to CBAs that have provisions in there that aren't that aren't um, conducive to alternative ed. Okay. I do know that within the law already you do have one of the 17 criteria that says that person has to be um, qualified to work with that risk so there needs to be some kind of reasoning towards you know that well, that job performance that but I think that could even help in the short term if we added some, if we thought about what that documentation or evidence needed to be in the short term, and absolutely we can look at the verbiage of that particular criteria. I do know it's in there. It's just, it just down to interpretation at the district level, so I can seems, work with Carolyn. It seems to me like if you're working in a, like say in our district, um, our district can qualify all our teachers working with at-risk students because all our students are pretty much at risk. Right. But I wouldn't want certain teachers in my district to be able to come over and receive a 5% bonus because they got kicked out of their school for cursing out a, a student in the middle of their classroom. Right. Those aren't, those aren't those the Those are power struggles that aren't I, good for I don't right. want to particularly have but may not have a say. So if right. it was in law that, that we have the final say into who goes into our buildings, then that would that would be more than just that have have a history of working with at risk youth. Because having a history of working with at risk youth don't mean you were effective at working with at risk youth. Right. Yeah, so so this is a great idea what you have. Um, hilarious because I fought that for 20 years. You know. Oh we got a new basketball assistant coach Absolutely. and we need a place to put him. He's coming over. Great. Yeah. <laughs> but he's going to be gone. He's going to be gone thirty percent of the time for tournaments. <laughs> um, dealt with that for years. So literally, and another teacher, she's being fired. Get this, but we don't want to cut her contract. So, do you have any place you could seriously? You're firing her for punching a student, and do you want her in this setting? Because we could punch all the students all day, you know. <laughs> 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 so it's like not the best scenario. Um, so what kind of like what are you gonna say exactly to put this in law? What I'd I'd have to I'd have to word it out. I mean the, the idea pretty, that we pretty would write this that, down and go. That no teacher can be just placed through a human resource department. Um, into an alternative ed program yeah, without be. first going through a, a qualification that includes input from the uh, building principal. 
I don't know if you can hear me involved. Y'all just yeah. keep talking, but I'm feeling really good about my place. Sometimes I'll take that. Principal doesn't always get to say. I do the I'll take that coach all day long because they're organized, they love kids. But those people come to you like that, they ought to be coming to you on an admonishment of plan improvement or something. I mean, and if you don't, I mean, if. Oh, I just said no, absolutely not. If you don't last long, if you don't last long in my building, then I'll terminate you and go home. I mean, yeah, I, you got to pass the pawpaw rule, or you don't get to teach with me. Yeah. So. <laughs> but you've got to have your superintendent support that. Right, right. Yeah, and they don't always. I've right. been there longer than him. But. Yeah. <laughs> So things we can look at, like I said, in the short term, we can look at the, the faculty selection portion of the rubric because it is one of the 17 criteria, now 16 criteria. I know it's very broad because it just says that the teacher needs to have some kind of experience or expertise in working with at-risk kids. And then that would go back, again, to local decision um, and who kind of has that say in having that conversation. So looking at the components of the rubric and then the two of you, since you're both Oklahoma City, so I'll just point to you, having that conversation and seeing. And then I will work with cabinet to see if there is anything we can do to kind of beef up that verbiage. But that verbiage is in there to kind of give you that power already. Okay. Anything else? working groups, you know, so in the new law, we've said that there could be an evaluation schedule for effective and highly effective programs to allow them to be evaluated every three years, and right. so that might be a good an appropriate working group to kind of figure out what that might would look like, um, and then the state board would have to approve it, so it would have to be a proposal to the state board and then an, uh, an approval by them, but if I mean, that suggestion came from this group, so if we feel like that's valuable to move forward with, then that could be a possible working okay. group as far as under evaluation. Right? I would say with Oklahoma City, in the, the Oklahoma Dominant Conversation, um, the evaluation actually gives us a bargaining like we're looking at the end of the year, so mm -hmm. I would hope that there will be this opting in, opting out of that three year evaluation. Mm -hmm. So at the, end, like at the end of this year, I've been able to use our evaluations multiple times around like we now need behavioralists or we are doing this uh, restorative practices and so like that's been critical for us so as long as there's this opt-in, out-out, opt-in, out-out component of that, I think it would help benefit the more of this Okay. Okay. And I do know that right now everybody is every other year unless you're in one of those three areas, new director, new program, struggling program. So that means that if you're falling in that non-compliant in any one of those areas that puts you on that list, I just know that that was still 130 of you of the 317. So, um, uh, and I do know that Dr. Ellis and I are working on metrics to kind of focus on restorative practice because looking at the data that has come in, we are still focused on re-engaging those dropouts and kind of using that data, um, but we have just as many kids that aren't coming back after a suspension from all dead, and so you're really the alternate to suspension, so how can we best help programs and really looking at and researching that restorative justice approach? This is going back, let's take a question for you, but going back to the six sites, I think it'll be difficult, no matter how we try to, you try to do it, to come up with an A to F based on what the federal guidelines are. Just the simple step of when this thing was released to the media, that maybe those six sites weren't automatically out for all the newspapers to print, and there was even a lot of things possible, but what proposed the most recent State Department evaluation, rubric one, that was almost a, in parentheses, I don't know if that could happen, but I don't would have to be put out there for the public, but it's just, it's that initial kick out when the, the local newspaper prints everybody's score. If it wasn't listed for even a week for everybody to grab a hold of those six sites, at least it's not on the front page of the paper, and then the superintendent is putting out a good word of our program to kind of counter it. Or even if in parentheses it said the State Department's evaluation is an effective program, but, you know, dude, I don't know. I'm just, and that may not be possible, but to me that'd be the simpler answer, because I think no matter how you try to collect data on student achievement from a test score, due to partly just the low numbers you're testing to begin with, and due to the gaps they're coming in with, and they're starting off with such low attendance, and they're, 
uh, at the end of the day, I don't know if we'll end up being able to get you out of the D or F range if those are the metrics you're going to use to get that A to F. You know, I think we could rearrange things all day long. And so, I don't, so just an idea, you know, but at least the public would go, oh, they <laughs> are not having to do a self-promotion tour. We go, hey, look what we got out, we're effective, we're highly effective. Okay. Okay. So those are the four working groups. Do we want to add, definitely adding another to the evaluation, objective to the evaluation working group? Um, do we want to add a subpopulation working group where we're kind of talking about the at-risk and breaking down those different needs? Is that something yes, no? It's, could that just be done within the data working group? Not something we're wanting? I think it can be included in the data working group. Okay. I think it's just part of it. When you're looking at what data to collect, you have to break it down by subgroup anyway. Okay. So maybe making some adjustments to those two, two sets of those two working groups goals, objectives. Okay. The overall goals that are listed on your agenda, do those still kind of highlight what we're wanting to accomplish? Marty was even like, oh, this is just what it has to be. If not, then you had to like scroll over, go back. But you do have hard copies in your, your folders as well. Are those still good overarching goals for the group? of a virtual alternative education student. Like I said, we already have established a credit recovery student. We've already updated the alt-ed student definition to include different subpopulations and some small tweaks. This is in your folder. So instead of saying this is a virtual student and then anything else could be we just decided to do this is a virtual alt ed student so that you kind of saw that as a virtual student you still have to be compliant with the 17 criteria. In the blended model, you know, traditional, all dead, and all those different, those were some of the tweaks we made in the all dead definition. So we already kind of have that blended approach already kind of hashed out. And now in rules. So in all of them, the teacher has to be logged on at all times with the student? I don't understand that. Because no, they don't, because that's where you can have. Um, they can have um, projects that they're working on over here. But if I'm holding you guys to a student-teacher ratio, we needed to have some kind of conversation about holding a virtual to, to a student-teacher to make sure that we're meeting those 17 criteria. Mm -hmm. But just like some of you have a morning class and an afternoon class, or you have, you know, they kind of have their classes, their master schedule as well. So that they're, again, pulling in those small po um, populations groups to work with them, but you can still have them doing things over here in the periphery. Okay. Right? So that kind of going back to when you think of a brick and mortar, you've got your credit recovery, you've got your all dead, you've got your virtual, you've got your virtual is still going to have all those components as well. Because the ratio is still pretty much 15. Mm -hmm. At that one time that you can still, just like you guys, you have those 
periphery kids doing things. So when it, that last where the only about this is specialized virtual programming, is that meant to differentiate from just virtual programming? Correct. So like in other words, they're virtual, but then ones that are like you mean, I think uses that blended approach where mm -hmm. kids come in twice a week to the English class. Right. But you still have to have that significant interaction with student. So I think about this is it, are we moving toward virtual arts alternative schools? No, like we already have Insight School of Oklahoma, um, and then we have some of you that have established your all dead programming and a virtual component to that. So we just want to clearly, now that we have this new law, we want to clearly say, especially Missy and I get those phone calls. We're like, well, I have this kid that only comes to see me this once a week, you know, for like a couple of hours. Where do I put him in my data? Or now we're just really trying to identify to help you guys kind of establish your different options and programming, but we already have them existing. It's just putting that definition down in paper. I just asked that something around contact hours be in there. I hear virtual, I think around the parameters of that nine face-to-face -face contact. Our kids, we've, we've shifted to blended learning. Uh, it's been a difficult shift, um, and a lot of folks have adopted the Google Classroom. So you'll walk in classes and it's kid and computer. Our kids need as much direct instruction as possible. And so right. I would just, the contact hour mm -hmm. piece is so critical um, because the teachers, the teachers don't understand the role of facilitative instruction right. as opposed to just being teacher record. Right. So I'm just saying right. that, that Okay, so contact hours in there? Because I know that when I walk in and they're like, well, I have Odyssey Wear, and it was like not at any point did Odyssey Wear take the place of you as the teacher, right? But that's not the point. Like we still want the, want that interaction. We just want to be able to identify and kind of define all the different programs because we want the broad option of programs for students. It's just to kind of help you guys then plug in what do I actually offer kids? Okay. And that's that's where I was thinking. Because I get so many kids who are coming from K-12 or Epic or one of those other online programs, and they just weren't disciplined enough to uh, to be able to be successful. And uh, they they come in. That's that's exactly the verbiage they tell me. I can't do it just sitting in front of a computer. Right. And so when I read this, we're not talking about a virtual school where they're at home doing this. This could be while they're in my building. So they can still receive those wraparound services and right. still take advantage of, say, our daycare right. if, if that's it. And then... Because um, you're not going to have, like, low socioeconomic. You're going to have kids in the court system that have been mandated. So they may have to utilize your Wi-Fi. They may have to utilize your resources. Um, or you guys help them in assistance with, with those resources. We, we change just locally we changed our from like virtual school we call it distant learning we got just because you know we have some kids that they just they don't have a hot spot they don't have wi-fi they don't have anything so yeah you're virtual school but we're sending the book home with you right and, and to answer your question a little bit in that about how different schools do it like we know that this young lady could go home have a baby three months from now We've already got her going, and then it's February. She has her baby. She's at the house. She can still do her computer work or whatever. And if she doesn't come back on our campus for three, four weeks, we go to them. So we're on the porch. We're whatever. So that's you know, that's how we've separated ours out because right. they want me to handle all virtual learning, and a lot of them don't want to come on campus at least two afternoons a week, or we're coming to your house one, one way or another. We got to see you. what you said is exactly right. And so we just, like I said, want to define all the different options that are even already existing out there, but then this will help with data and with understanding your own programming and options. Any questions? I, I do think, though, that this does still encompass just what you said there with full-time virtual with kids at home mm -hmm. and doing it. And I know there's always a big debate, actually, between full-time virtual and blended, right, and what is what, and I think that's where you referenced that nine hours. And I think that nine hours, though, is being taken out of the rules. Because before they were limited, you full-time virtual, you couldn't go over nine hours because then it became blended, mm -hmm. right? And where you're talking about if they're in the classroom, 
all of the time doing the work. To me, that's a blended model, you know. But it, but I don't think that's always been a debate, even where that line is between the two. But but I think that, um, and so I don't know if we want to look even even more at what you you said. You kind of referenced blended in there to you know to try to yeah. define. What are we calling blended versus what are we calling full-time virtual? Right. I know we, we use some blended verbiage in the alt-ed definition. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, I don't feel like it needs to be in this definition since we've got it over here. What does it say over there? I don't recall. Do you have that? No. It's in the, in the law? It should be in the, and I can't remember if we got it in this time or if it's supposed to be next time that it, it's, it's the yellow. Yeah, and there's some yellow on the back as well. So if you're not already set up like inside is around the 17 criteria, it would seem difficult to really call yourself, your student, a full-time virtual alt okay. student. But you could still have a virtual student, just not with the 17 criteria. Right. So if you're, you'd have to be very purposeful around that you are right. still doing, otherwise we just, because we have students that go from us to online, but I wouldn't want to be right. counting those as part of my number. Right. But well. like Cheryl has two. She has... Oklahoma virtual, those are just virtual, and then she has inside, which are virtual all dead. Right. Does that, I mean, like, yeah. they're very purposeful in their programming yeah. and how they're still serving the 17 criteria. But I think that's why, like, to me, that's where, so they're enrolled in that special program built around the 17. I mean, I right. think that's the key, is that the, the program itself had to be designed around the alt yeah. requirements, <laughs> and you're enrolled in that program. It's right. not just you happen to be doing virtual learning, right? Yeah. And we don't have to decide on anything. At this point, I just, with the new law and the new rules, wanted to start having the conversations. So now we can kind of ponder it. The funding working group or anybody that wants to to, to um, be a part of that conversation, we can even come back and look at contact hours and those kinds of things. I just wanted to go ahead and start having that conversation as we enter into it the next school year. Okay. I think that's it. Courtney could not be here. Does anybody that hasn't talked about their program want to talk about their program since Warner couldn't be here? Jay, have you talked about yours yet? <laughs> you want to give a five minute spiel on what you do? Boy, do you? Oh, yeah, I can. I, mean, I don't know if I'll play five minutes. I can talk about the program. <laughs> I took over Gateway. This is my fourth year that and when uh, one of the things one of the huge things that I noticed when I took over the program was that there was really no difference between what we did in the uh, lot public schools all dead program than any other three high schools I mean it was the exact same thing so when we uh, so we started looking and my staff started looking we looked and, um, we we decided that we would move towards a uh, personalized learning which is a blended model um, uh, type deal. All of our curriculum is, in, all the curriculum is internet based, but you know, we also meet, um, we have a schedule where every class, even for graduation, meets throughout the week. Um, and that for those kids that need that, can go with that. If they're on task, if they're on pace and they're working by themselves and that, then that. We do all the other things. Um, our focus is being on pace. Uh, um, that's our huge focus, so we really celebrate that a lot, is whenever they get a class done. Anytime a student gets a class done at our place, um, we stop what we're doing, we announce their name, they come out, um, the whole school comes out in the hall, They we got a fire bell on our, they, they ring the fire bells, and then they get a gold star that we put on the floor for every class, and we had um, 800, I think 816 semester uh, credits given out this um, this semester, which is a increase. When we first started, we were given out credits about at about a rate of 50 percent for classes offered 50 percent. And this year, we got it up to 60 percent. So um, you know, we we we've, um, we've moved. We've had a, a, a great increase there. Um, it's been a lot of work. We've been working on changing the culture. That's one of the things we're seeing. Our kids come the, um, to us, and, and they they realize that they can be successful. And that's, that's what our focus is. is we start celebrating success, and, and that, and, and that we have four celebrations a year where we give away gift cards, and 
stuff and celebrate that. Every time they get a class done, we give them a new transcript so they can see uh, what they're moving yeah, toward, their progress. Yeah. I mean, everything we do is built on um, on having um, uh, uh, those kids that have never had much success um, building on the fact that they can have success so we can build um, that. Uh, we, um, each one of my kids are assigned a mentor. They meet with those mentors daily. Um, that's an area that we're going to really work on and strive next year to improve that mentor time. Um, we're going to do our ICAP stuff in there. We're going to do our career stuff in there. We're going to do, um, um, we're going to have an art component in there. Um, we're going to, uh, uh, that um, we have, I'm real lucky I have multiple outside agencies come in as far as uh, provide different type of counseling and, and that, uh, 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 all in all, we just, I mean, our deal is, is we're just trying to help students in any way we can. Um, it's interesting, I, I like the discussion. Um, I'm over our state all dead programs, but I'm also over our discipline school, and I have various different functions, but um, they've given a, me a task and let me hire somebody, and we're going to start a virtual school in um, this next coming school year. Um, so uh, it's not going to be, we're not going to tie our all dead to it. Um, it's going to be something separate. It's just going to be another way to help uh, serve students. Um, with this year, we're at a hunt. I have 110 slots. Um, I think I've got approval to have 150 slots next year at Gateway. Also have three remote uh, remote locations. Uh, one has uh, um, 20 slots. Um, one has 30 slots, and one has 15 at each one of the three high schools. So um, um, we'll be up over 200 and some slots or average. And, um, we had a waiting list all year long. It was one of the southern points uh, to uh, to be able to uh, move up to 150 for them to 100 fund 150. Um, um, that because um, every student has to have a Chromebook. Every student has to have a site li uh, license to on our LMS uh, and uh, that. So um, I'm doing much better at just answering questions. Any questions? <laughs> What's the remote? Is that, is that the high school or like a one room? A one, it's more of a one room, one teacher type situation. Yeah, Those kids, it's different? not disciplinary. None of our alt ed is, because uh, we have a separate disciplinary school yeah. that I oversee. Uh, it's not disciplinary, but those kids either don't want to leave come over our, or they're on the waiting list to get in and they just um, uh, that or that teacher has built a rapport with them through their credit recovery program or something like that and, and that so it's it's just another way those kids um, just are more comfortable there and that's why why we did it. we there was just a need to do that uh, it happened really just one school kind of started that and then it kind of grew into the other schools and um, they were doing it and on that we just felt like that we needed to uh, um, actually put it truly under all dead so for uh, for consistency across the district and that instead of just having a program that really wasn't really wasn't uh, over there was no oversight on it <laughs> so um, uh, that any other questions so one more thing so we've had someone ask about prevention and substance abuse programming, right? Yes. And so who do you bring from the outside? What curriculums? If you have curriculums, what are you guys doing in those areas? We have a, a couple we have a we have a couple groups that we bring in from the outside. So uh, we have partnerships with with uh, Oklahoma City Mental Health and we have uh, partnerships with um, with uh, Pivot and also North Care, and when we we have a curriculum that's a uh, alcohol ed or something that that uh, we use, and it does an online curriculum that does a questionnaire with the uh, with the uh, uh, parents as well as the students, and we're going to implement that in our intake next year. Uh, we we are going to restructure our intake so that the first day they come for orientation, they learn about the school, the rules, and the climate, and then the next day they come in, 
do their assessments, meet with our, our counselors, and then um, and then meet with our social workers and and determine based on their uh, intake scores what services they need, and then we're hoping to have a um, an in-house uh, mental wellness uh, person uh, from from one of the agencies. We're in talks with them right now, and possibly even having uh, some some health care, physical health care, that they can offer to our uh, babies and our parents. One of our the counselors we came in is sponsored through Team Core, and, and they have to grant through them. And so uh, that the main focus on there is drug and alcohol that come in and, they, and she meets with uh, each each one of those mentor group we kind of double them up and she meets with them weekly and goes over that kind of, and that's a main focus there. Okay. Any other prevention somewhat around do you want prevention or just substance abuse? My problem is I get kids because they get caught with drugs. And then, and then they come high to school right. for me. Right. And I'm not going to kick them off for that because they just got kicked to the curb already for what happened in high school. So I'm trying to look for something that's an intervention instead of that's just punitive. Right. Yeah. I used a chance to change. They have a chance to succeed program. It's a eight week substance abuse program and they came out and did that for free. I believe Boulevard still does use that. And they're just, they're, 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 they're No, you're fine, you're finished. You're just saying you reach out to the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use Services. I mean, they provide lots of free services. And Heather in the area. <laughs> Actually, we worked with Jack's group at the Oklahoma City Public School District and we helped them create a comprehensive mental health plan that had prevention, intervention, and treatment components. So a lot of people don't realize I, th I think we're becoming a little more aware that substance use is preventable, like we can do things at the population level to make populations less likely to have issues with substance use, but a lot of mental illness is also preventable and we can do things on the population level. We should not be waiting until people are ill and are in treatment and need to develop CB skills, cognitive behavioral skills. We should be doing those things across the lifespan early on. So. Uh, and then for that mental illness that would happen anyway, we can mitigate uh, the effects of it oftentimes with these population level programs. But um, Jack was on our committee of planners, and so we did advise some things, so we included alternative ed. But that's something that we're doing more and more of. We have a survey that we do at the district level. We have state level surveys, which we use all the time, but we have a district level survey that we actually can measure the root causes. So I don't think it's helpful to say what issues we have and plus you guys know what issues you have clearly um, but we look at root causes and address those specifically because the root causes at one school are not necessarily the same at every school so we really have to get at what is driving the behavior um, so that's something that we offer uh, one of my jobs is increasingly to help schools consult look at their data and figure out what is the most evidence-based response to that it is often not more curriculum because we know for one that is not always what is needed uh, pumping people with more information is not the full solution. Um, but also because we hear clearly that there's not always time for that. And so a lot of things, there are a lot of very simple, no cost things that you can do. Um, and then there's some really expensive, time intensive things you can do and, and a bunch of things in between. So I'm always happy to talk to anyone about that. My question to you though, you said you had uh, students come to school high and, and, and high on what? I mean, what, what do you think they Well, using? they don't smell like pot. So I have no idea. Well, the sniff test is hard. They vape it now. Yeah. Yeah. So and so I, that, that's, that's kind of where I came this year. It's kind of like, you know, used to if you walk into my building, hey, come have a seat. And we'd visit one time, call a parent. But now I, they're coming in on this side like, Hey, Jack. And then it, on this side, like, oh, you got your medical card. Because you get a medical card as a kid. I mean, and so you got them both coming at you, and and I'm I'm not going to kick you out because you smoked with your mama this morning before you came to school. And so that's... Right. And, and it is harder and harder. I mean, used to, I could shut the ventilation off in the room and I could go find it. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need it all, but it, it, it is harder. And, and, with, and so with those things coming and the vape and the, and the, the 
gummies and all that. And so, uh, there were times you had to get personal with the kid. The teacher's like, I've got someone that stinks. And you're like, So, have you cut that out for two then? They're like, Get away from me. Stop sniffing me. <laughs> Anything else? I will say, too, like we've added, if, I, if you don't mind me adding one more thing, we've added some mental health components to our questionnaires in the last administration cycle. And so one thing that's really alarming, we know we have mental health issues um, in our state, obviously, but um, around 40% of the kids are coming back with like, moderate to a high level of psychological distress and with likely put the need for treatment. So we're asking them things like, in the past 30 days, how often did you feel hopeless? How often did you feel worthless? And they are answering like, like almost half the kids are answering most or all the time. And even when you cut across socioeconomic or different demographics, it's pretty universal. Um, that was one of the things we worked with Jack on. And so even we were looking at like, how do we help kids not feel worthless most or all the time in an alternative school setting? What does that look like? Like, how do we welcome someone into that setting? So I think sometimes kids use dress because they work, you know. I mean, they're not the tool we want. It's like using a sledgehammer to nail in a nail. Um, it's destructive, but we've got to give them other things. Right. Replace it with something. Yeah, other coping skills. Right. And those coping skills are difficult and take a lifetime to practice, and you have to have them modeled, and, you know, most of us never have them excuse to us. So are those services free, or do you have to <laughs> no, well, so the prevention services, which is more where I work, um, they are, some of them are free. Some of them are provided by us, like the alcohol EDU that Jack mentioned, um, that's provided by us at this point. Uh, we have capacity for a certain number of schools. Um, some things are, there is a cost associated, so we put together a fundraising plan for uh, Oklahoma City, and they're working with the like, United Way to, to do that. Um, on the treatment side, it's also a combination. Some things are offered through Department of Mental Health. Um, some things are you know, built through Medicaid or what have you, and then some things that are cost to. Um, it just kind of depends on what it is and how it's structured. The prevention things are, you know, for the return on investment, so much cheaper than, you know, what we pay a treatment in the end. Um, but yeah, there are, there are some things that are affordable and some things that could be skilled, like the CB skills, um, which is something that we're trying to promote and also that all people should have these cognitive behavioral skills, not just people that get sick and then not just people that can access treatment. We all, we all need these skills just to use the things we learn in school, to function in life. Um, you know, that is one, there's a really great evidence-based model that we're attempting to bring to OKCPS. And you can scale it a number of ways. That has more to do with equipping the teachers to model behavior. It's, it's like parenting, you know, if you sit at the dinner table one night and you're like, it's really important to have, like, positive thought processes, and that's all you ever did, your kid is likely not to get a lot out of that. But when you model it and integrate it and bring it back into conversations as you go, then they're going to practice it and get it. So um, it's more about like training teachers to do it. So there's a few ways that you can do it in terms of how intense you want to be. So it just depends on the setting. But I mean, we're happy to, to help you guys um, have those conversations and to connect you to the right people. We have some TV for teachers then. You can come out and do like a workshop. So if nobody else has anything, then we are.